So thank you everyone um, for joining this webinar for the Equiano Project. The Equiano Project is a debate, discussion and ideas forum where we um, delve deep into complex social issues, finding meaningful solutions and promoting free speech, open debate and intellectual curiosity. I'm Anaya Falaran Iman, I'm the founder and director of the Equiano Project and I'm going to be chairing this discussion today. And this webinar is on poor socioeconomic outcomes, causes, consequences, and potential solutions. So for several months now, the dominant conversation about socioeconomic outcomes has been the role that race plays, but what has been lacking significantly has been an analysis of class, individual behavior, culture, and wider socioeconomic structures. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed uh, gross inequalities in education, health, housing, employment, policing and society at large. And this webinar seeks to examine the causes, consequences and possible solutions when it comes to those um, poor socioeconomic outcomes. Questions we want to examine is what is the state of social mobility um, in Britain? Why is there um, so much variation in socioeconomic outcomes for different ethnic groups? individual behavior or social structures, what impacts outcomes more? What does the role of cultural norms and social behaviors play in economic disparities between different ethnic groups? Why um, are certain ethnic groups overrepresented in certain crime statistics? How do we support young people um, from low socioeconomic backgrounds and how do we foster a sense of agency in young people and wider society? So these are some of the questions that we're hoping to dive deep into tonight. And we're joined by an esteemed panel to examine these questions. So we're joined by Dr. Rakib Essan, who is a writer and researcher at the Henry Jackson Society. We're joined also by Ishmael Lea South, who is the director of the Salam Project. And um, we're also joined by Nick Buckley, the founder of Mancunian Way, an anti-social behavior and homelessness charity. And we are also joined, last but not least, by um, Kevin Hurley, who is a former Met Police Chief. And so I would just outline quickly um, the, the structure of this tonight's discussion. So we'll start off with each panelist giving their introductory statements, outlining their perspective on um, this, this um, subject tonight. Then we will have about half an hour um, discussion amongst ourselves. So panelists, feel free to challenge um, one another or comment on something that someone said in their introductory remark or build upon um, something that the other panelists has said. And I will also be asking questions. And the final half an hour will be taking questions from um, the audience. So please engage, write your questions down and also engage throughout um, in the, in the um, uh, speaker box that you can kind of comment. I, I really love to um, read many of the things that people are saying and their thoughts on the subject. So yeah, please um, engage with the things that the speakers are saying. So yes, the, we are firstly going to please um, hear from Dr. Uh, Ricky. Hi there, thank you for that, Inaya. So we're discussing today, essentially, why do racial and ethnic disparities exist? And what shapes what we would consider to be negative socioeconomic outcomes? And I think it's great that we are discussing this. And no doubt, it, we, we, will, we, we will have a very lively conversation on it. I think what I would, I'll start off by pointing out what I think are weaknesses. Uh, in pre prevailing narratives that I've come across, especially with race related issues very much coming to the forefront of the national political agenda. I think I'd, I'd really start off with this point that when you, we are discussing racial and ethnic disparities, we're talking about outcomes which are not necessarily the dire direct byproduct of structural racism. I think that this is often, you know, we, we, we've seen a great deal of what I would consider to be reductive analysis in this, in this discussion space. And I think, it's, I think it's extremely unhelpful in terms of moving on, moving on the discussion. When we're looking at different uh, socioeconomic outcomes between different uh, ethnic and racial groups in British society, there's so many things that shape those outcomes. Uh, for example, migratory background, uh, English language skills on arrival. Indeed, where what is the sort of economic context that people are coming from? Uh, 
I also feel that cultural attitudes towards social integration, mixing with people from a different background to you, which enables the development of those bridging contacts, which can help with economic progress. I think there are differences between different ethnic groups there. And I think all too often when we're talking about ethnic and racial disparities, I think the conversation is too focused on the system. Now, I think there's definitely improvements to be made in terms of creating a more meritocratic society in, in the UK. No two ways about it. There's been numerous studies. I think everyone's come across it, those sort of, you know, those CV field studies. If there's one more ethnic minority sounding name and there's a more traditionally English sounding name, you know, controlling for educational level of educational attainment, uh, work experience. It's the, it's, the, it's the CV with the, English, the traditionally English sounding name, which tends to make more headway in, in, in application stages. And I've, I've always made the point that I think that name blind applications across the board is, a, is something that needs to happen in the UK just to work, just to go some way towards working towards those ethnic and racial penalties in the labour market. So there's no denying that there are that there are improvements to be made, especially, you know, in markets, whether that's the labour market. I think there's instances of racial, ethnic and religious penalties in housing as well, especially when it comes to the uh, private rented uh, sector. There are issues there. But I think when we're looking at the socioeconomic context, I think all too often we don't discuss what are the issues internally within particular ethnic and religious groups when we're talking about socioeconomic outcomes. As we've previously discussed, I've talked a great deal about female empowerment within certain ethnic minority groups or the lack of it and how that might uh, play a critical role in shaping negative socioeconomic outcomes. Now, of course, it, it, there are studies which have shown that, for example, there is a religious penalty. Uh, it's called the Muslim penalty um, in the British labor market. Now, whether that, le whether that leads to the, the level of female unemployment within, Bang uh, within the Britain's Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin communities, when you look at, for example, women of Indian origin, they're far more likely to be economically active in comparison to women of Bangladeshi and Pakistani origin. Now, I feel that when you look at these figures, is it simply a matter of a, a sort of anti-Muslim penalty of the labor market? I'm not too sure. I think there you have to really look at religio-cultural factors, just sort of, you know, what the kind of gender norms within specific groups. And I think, unfortunately, this is where the contemporary British left is quite weak. A uh, contemporary British left, which frames itself as, you know, pro-women, you know, strong feminists. Yeah, well, when it comes to these kind of issues, when it's talking about female empowerment within um, ethnic minority communities in the British context, it's not really discussed. I think that what I'm trying to get at is that, that, that when we're looking at socioeconomic outcomes, there it's just shaped by a range of range of factors. It, it depends on where people initially come from in terms of the economic and cultural context. When it comes to an arrival, it even matters where they're actually dispersed within within the UK. Uh, certain groups are more concentrated in areas where there may be greater economic opportunities. Other groups may be more concentrated in areas which have been starved of meaningful public investment for decades. They have suffered a great deal of industrial decline under the strong winds of globalization. There are so many factors that come into play, and I think all too often they're overlooked, they're neglected, and I think much of that is actually politically motivated. Some of it will be ignorance. Let's not, let's not get away from that. But I think some, some of the times these factors, people are reluctant to talk about them because it doesn't fit in with their, how do you say, their prevailing political narratives. So j just, to, just to finish off, I think that if you aren't willing to discuss what I would consider to be the important internal cultural factors, you know, talking about, you know, uh, female empowerment, talking about attitudes towards social integration or mixing with people of a different ethnic, racial or religious background. If you're not willing to talk about those kinds of factors, then in truth, you're not going to contribute very much when it comes to debates on how to facilitate social progress and economic advancement within certain ethnic, racial and religious minorities living in, uh, living in the UK. And I'll, I'll leave that there. Thank you very much, Rakib. And I've definitely got lots of questions to ask you um, once we've heard from the introductory statement. So next, we'd love to hear from you, um, Ishmael. 
uh, about what you your perspective on this subject. Oh, let me unmute you. There we go. Lord to me. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, basically, I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation. So basically, my name is Ismail Issel. I'm the founder and director of the Salam Project. We do work around underachievement in school, knife crime, BAME youth and community un unemployment, extremism, radicalization, offending, reoffending, and racial inequality. We believe that we're a solution-based service because we find that a lot of people who are working in our space are coming from a victim mentality that is counterproductive. Now, as we know, we recently faced the lockdown drama where many people have been suffering from mental health and there's many issues around um, unemployment and low income wage. Recently, we noticed we started to hear the wave of Black Lives Matter, okay? And we know here in the UK, there are issues with racial inequality with the McPherson report around Stephen Lawrence and the Lamy review. Okay. We strongly believe that distractions like TV programs, tearing down statues are minor distractions to the actual reality of challenging institutionalized racism and police um, accountability in communities. As a person of African Caribbean heritage, it was refreshing and brilliant to see that in the UK, that we have allowed our sports stars to show solidarity in challenging racial inequality by taking the knee, whereby in America, a person called Colin Kaepernick can't get a job. But it's been refreshing to see a multicultural Britain working together to challenge racial inequality, which is, I think is very inspiring for our young people in communities. Um, now, as we know, many of the recent Black Lives Matter protests, many of them were not even organized by members of Black Lives Matter. And sadly, we strongly believe, and from our intel, that many of their marches were hijacked by hard left extremist groups and other extremist groups from around the UK. Um, from the issue, there's issues around stop and search among our young people. And we work towards giving young people an awareness of how to deal positively with police. I believe one of the major issues with certain communities, especially African, Afro-Caribbean, so-called Bain communities, are attitudes. And if we can deal with attitudes with emotional intelligence, critical thinking, solutions, many issues can be dealt with. You know, there's issues around unconscious bias and there's issues of mental health. Um, disparity and inequality in society has ripple effects in communities like mental health. Um, we, as a solution-based organization, what we've done is we've teamed up with um, so-called BAME business owners around the UK, especially London and Manchester, to give work experience to our young people during the lockdown to raise their aspirations, build their confidence and build their resilience. And I believe that this is the way that we need to be thinking forward. Yes, inequality exists in society. Yes, um, there's injustices, but we need to be thinking positive for our young people and for the future. So we need people who have been trailblazers from our community to put their hand down and then to come back and mentor the younger generation to inspire them, to, as in, to aspire in society. Um, it's important that we encourage more education, qualifications, experience, education, and get experience in certain fields. And a, com a special commendation to Justin Onakwesi from Legal and General, He's recently started up a project called Talk About Black to encourage more black um, people of African and Afro-Caribbean heritage to get involved in the finance world. And this project, and they've also started up a project called uh, 100 Interns, 
was is trying to get more people from the African, Afro-Caribbean community into financial internships, whether it's in stockbroking, bank managing work, and other senior positions within the finance sector. According to the Voice newspaper, on the 20th of July, it stated that Brit black British businesses contribute over 25 billion pounds to the British economy. So I'm of the opinion that we as people, as elders in the community, because I've got a few gray hairs now, so I consider myself a little elder, we need to be showcasing our young people our excellence, we need to be showcasing our achievements, we need to be showcasing, yes, the disparity, yes, the inequality, just like in any other society, but we also need to put a balance by showcasing the excellence, the achievement in society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ismail. And yes, you know, I've got um, a lot of questions uh, for you um, afterwards. Thank um, you. Next, um, we'd like to hear from you, Nick. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invite today. Um, so socioeconomic outcomes across our country. Um, as Wakib said, it, it's, it's such a complicated issue. There's hundreds of reasons why we have some of these discrepancies. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the experiences I've had of two decades working on streets, working with challenging young people, um, doing some work in schools as well. For me, one of the biggest issues is several fold. It comes down to academic education. Our whole society um, is moving towards a more academic jobs market, where if you can't read, you, you know, if you, not if you can't read, if you're reading and writing is extremely poor, if you're not IT literate, you are, you're not avoiding, you, you're not gonna get those opportunities of those jobs, of those well-paid jobs. Um, and our schools are not geared up how they should be. Schools are better than they used to be, and they're still improving, but the one size fits all education we have in the UK, which promotes university education. And if you're a young person who doesn't like school, who's not academically gifted, or maybe intelligent, but doesn't like the routine of school, those young people are almost always set up to fail. And they end up not going, they end up kicking off, they end up getting kicked out. They're then attracted into gangs um, and those young people fail. And I've done a lot of work with those young people on the streets. So for me, it's about how do we educate better the next generation of young people, but educate them to get the jobs that are available. There's a certain amount of young people who want to be educated for many other reasons. So they can expand their knowledge, expand their understanding of the world. And that's great. But if the education isn't leading at some point to a job and to a better well-paid job, then for me, part of the education is wasted. I know some people will disagree with that, but that, that's how I feel over the last two decades. The best example I can give was about 15 years ago, I went to see a working class mum um, in Manchester. Her daughter was missing school and was causing antisocial behaviour um, in the neighbourhood where she lived during the afternoon and the evenings. So I went down to see her mum, knocked on the door, went in, had a cup of tea and chatting to her mum. Her mum's unemployed, never worked, had a lovely house. You know, it, it was a highly decorated, top everything. She had the biggest flat screen TV I've ever seen. This was 15 years ago when no one had flat screen TVs, but she did 15 years ago. Sat down talking about her daughter, talking about the opportunities she's missing, talking about the life opportunities that are being wasted if she doesn't get an education, if she carries on down this line, she's going to end up with a criminal record, that then will, some jobs will go then because of that. And her mum, very polite, said to me, it doesn't matter. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? She goes, I left school at 14. I've got no qualifications. I've never really had a job. And I've done okay in life. And I looked around that house and the TV and the car parked in the drive and thought, you have, you've done really well in life. How can I try to educate that mum that the best thing for her daughter 
is to value education so she can progress and aspire to be. Parents always want better for their children. Whoever you are, you want better. How could I have that conversation with her? Because the state had done everything for this family forever and they had quite a comfortable life and it was cultural in her household now this was their culture in that area of Manchester where I worked it was almost the culture you didn't do well at school school was a waste of time so until we have some of our communities really valuing education then they're not going to have the skills to progress into the well-paid jobs that this country has on offer a friend of mine once told me education is the gift we give our children and we need to remember that it's a gift we give them because that gift will be the gift that's always given back throughout their lives now on the flip side of that it's aspiration the amount of young people who i've spoken to in the last 15 years who have no aspiration whatsoever don't even want to be a premiership football player I can handle a 15 year old going, oh, I want to be like Wayne Rooney or Marcus Fassford. You know they're not going to make that, but at least they had a dream of, of getting better, of earning money, of being somebody. But the amount of young people we speak to who say, nothing, I don't want to be anybody. And when you have dozens of young people say that to you over years, it breaks your heart. How would we have not inspired our young people to want to want to be better, to be leaders, to push forward, to pay the bills for their mum. I, I, don't, I don't know how we've got into this situation. So for me, the one word is education. And I think that's how we deal with our socioeconomic problems we've got in this country. And it affects, it, go, it cuts across race, it cuts across gender, it cuts across everything. In pockets, certain pockets of our country, education is the key. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Nick. And last but not least, um, we would like to hear your contribution and introductory statements, um, Kevin. Well, first off, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and may I say some really uh, insightful uh, comments from the other three people present. What I would like to do just before I, I, I actually talk to the subject, I'd just like to explain I'm a little bit more than a former policeman, uh, because people will tend to pigeonhole me watching that, say, oh yes, okay, that's what he is. At the current time, I work as a uh, freelance international security consultant, having been working in Kenya. Um, and uh, last year I worked for a year in Afghanistan, where I was advising the Minister of Interior, uh, the NATO generals, uh, and indeed chiefs of police and anyone who would work with me on how we might repair a fractured nation. I've done similar in Iraq as well. Um, and also I've been an elected politician where I was the elected, albeit independent, uh, police and crime commissioner for the county of Surrey, which for those people who don't know is a bit like being the mayor of London or the mayor of Manchester, but for that uh, county. Uh, and I did it as an independent in a county which is um, a solidly conservative one, but one as an independent. Prior to that, 30 odd years in the police. But to give you a bit of my heritage, um, I come from a family of nine members of the police in London. Mum, dad, uncle, uh, two brothers, uh, my two nephews, my son were all in the police. And I go back further and say, I'm named after the leading IRA man, uh, Kevin Barry was hanged by the British during the Irish Republican War and my grandfather was a member of the IRA. So you can pick the bones out of what I come from. But let's go back to um, some, of the, some of the points here. And I'd just like, before I go on, to highlight a couple of key points that really struck with me. Um, one was from Rakeeb saying, we don't deal with the internal uh, cultural factors. For example, he alluded to the position of many Pakistani and Bangladeshi women in underemployment, something no one ever really is prepared to talk about. And he says we need to get into that, that meat to understand what's going on, to really understand this kind of diff we're trying to deal with. Uh, great opening statement, I think, from Ismail saying victim mentalities are counterproductive. 
Um, and of course, Nick's Big One Education. If I might just talk briefly about the, the subject for me, and I base it on a combination of what I've seen of late in recent years in truly fractured nations where people's life chances are utterly appalling, i.e. Afghanistan, hence we get the issues of people making the, the desperate, dangerous journeys from such places to come to England, um, to my experiences as, as a, a police officer over the years, moving up, working in the inner city, in the most challenging places, Brixton, uh, Shepherd's Bush, anywhere like this, right the way uh, to being quite senior. Two things strike me as crucial in terms of social mobility. Um, and it's one thing I learned when I went to a conference many years ago um, about children, and it was a conference given by experts in that field who basically said, if you talk to any nursery teacher, they can point out kids to quote the old British phrase and say, he's gonna hang that one, he's gonna hang. This is what we used to say years and years ago. Uh, you might put that across to, they're gonna end up in youth offending, uh, youth and, and prison in the future. And the point that they were making is that if children at the most early ages are not given the correct social aspirations, the correct cultural views of moving forward, uh, at the very least, they've got no chance whatsoever uh, of achieving um, and, and really, if you like, uh, making their way up through the social spectrum. Um, examples of that, I might say, is if you look at a, a Hindu woman or a Sikh woman, many of them do extremely well uh, in society because both Hindu and Sikhs are very, very enthusiastic on education, um, as indeed are mid, what you might call middle-class Pakistani families. So it's therefore no surprise that uh, people from the South Indian heritage are disproportionately overrepresented in senior medical positions, uh, the dental trade, and operate most of the pharmacies around the country because they are, they are great aspirers and they bring that in at the earliest ages with um, uh, their children. Not so uh, with uh, some socioeconomic groups and I include in that white uh, uh, disadvantaged underclass, working class, that is not the case with the way in which they, their children are, are moved forward at the earliest stages. But the second and probably the most important one, and everyone else has said it, is without question, education uh, and the right kind of guidance from parents and of course the teachers as they move forward. Because what education does is it opens up your eyes to what the opportunities are, might be. And if we have a situation where education is neglected, and, and I think what I mean by that is we have a situation where basic discipline and understanding how society operates in education is neglected. Children, as they move into their teens, will not achieve their true potential. Having come back from Kenya recently, the one thing that truly impressed me about Kenyan kids and Kenyan mothers is the way all of them, when they go to school in the morning, and it's certainly been my experience when I've traveled in the Caribbean, they turn out their children immaculately dressed to such an extent that they may be absolutely dirt poor, but the, the girls' uniforms will be pressed, they'll have white socks, and the boys will take their shoes and socks off and walk to school barefoot and then put their shoes and socks on to go into the school. Discipline standards are maintained thereon from, from uh, what goes on in school, and mothers and fathers are extremely keen to see their kids' report cards and how they achieve. You know, it's no surprise if you look at some people, for example, from the Afro-Caribbean community who've done exceedingly well in their society, in our society, to find out that in fact, uh, the mum, and to some extent the dad, but the mum was a big role model in moving them forward, whether they were uh, a nurse or whatever, they understood and pushed the values of education. That, I think, to me, are the two key points, that if we don't get the nurture correct at the early stages in society, 
And that means, regardless of the ethnic background of kids, that we invest within social services to assist with parenting, uh, particularly with young mothers who may not have the aspirations themselves or the skills to help them uh, understand the importance and inspire their children from the earliest ages uh, to move forward, society as a whole is on a loser. Because if it doesn't start at that stage, it's not going to happen once they go to school, no matter how good uh, some of the schools can be. And there have been some great schools, and there are some great ones. I know of a, an excellent one up in northwest London. Um, I can't remember the name of the teacher, but uh, she's originally from Guyana, runs one um, with a very... Uh, I, I remember a conversation with her that she actually has got the word sing within her name. Although she's not, say again. Catherine Bible sing. Correct, correct, correct. Although she isn't, in fact, a, a Sikh. She's from Muslim heritage. From there. But those kind of schools, um, they, they kind of bring the correct values of standards and discipline in, almost drilling the kids at an early stage. And then after that, they move from what you might call a transactional teaching approach to a transformational one where the kids then start to develop from themselves. And I, I think, you know, the strength of families from anywhere in the world where the children do well is that they do have boundaries and standards maintained uh, for the children. Hence, I use that, that, those examples of Kenya or the Caribbean or Hindu Sikh families or aspirational Pakistani um, ones. And the, the, po the point I'll finish at this stage is to say, we've got a big problem in front of us in this country because as we move daily towards more and more use of artificial intelligence, uh, less and less engagement in what you might call manufacturing, more and more robots, uh, more and more machines doing what jobs that were once done by labourer or even semi-skilled or even skilled labourer. And I mean everything from making a road to building a building uh, to building cars. The employment was once there for people who would go to technical schools and become a tool maker, uh, perhaps an electrician, um, or other roles, they are being phased out by the way we operate. So the employment is not going to be there. And secondly, the days of Britain, living off its legacy of what I might say we perceive of greatness, which a lot of it was built on the, the money from the British Empire, the Industrial Revolution, we won't go into where that money came from, because we'll pretty much know a lot of the start was what we took from India or from sugar. Um, in the West Indies and so on to power the Industrial Revolution. But that money is gone. And we're now facing COVID, where last time around it was 20% reduction in our economy. I guarantee, or I'm guessing, it's going to be 25, 30% reduction uh, next time. The money is not there. So we need to be looking at how we, are, we get much smarter in building cohesion in our society in terms of the tutelage, if you like, of young mothers who've got social problems combined with um, re-establishing values and standards at schools to move the kids forward to become aspirational uh, and get educated. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and look, I didn't even touch on policing, did I? Well, I thank you very much, Kevin. But yeah, I, I will be asking you about that um, uh, in a second. So first, I would like to ask you some questions, um, Dr. Ricky. Um, you mentioned that obviously there are so many different factors at play when it comes to different outcomes. And obviously you were talking about particularly Bangladeshi, Indian, Pakistani. Um, why do you think that people jump to the kind of social structure um, element first without wanting to look at all of these um, range of issues and factors at play? Well, I think is. I think Kevin touched upon it. I just feel they're reluctant to engage with admittedly sensitive issues. I think it's easier to blame the broader system. It's either to blame uh, discrimination in the labour market. When it comes to talking about potentially problematic religio-cultural factors within ethnic minority groups, then certain, you know, a great number of people struggle to engage with those, in those, with those points. And I think it is hugely problematic because I feel if you really address the internal cultural factors, then you could really make some very serious headway. 
Uh, I, I, I think for me more broadly, you know, just touching on some of the points which have already been raised, I think the centrality of the family unit is so key to this discussion. Uh, I think it's interesting, you know, we're often presented with a picture of Black Britain, but there's, there's very clear differences, for example, between people of Black Caribbean and Black African origin. And it's reflected in, in a number of ways. It's reflected in terms of institutional trust. Now, I'll beat, I'll, I'll beat Kevin here and actually talk a little bit about the police first, talking about trust in the local police force. Uh, when it comes to asking people, do you trust local police? The figure for people of Black African origin is 76%, which is actually a little bit higher than the figure for white Brits. This is the most recent crime survey for England and Wales. The corresponding figure for people of Black Caribbean origin shoots all the way down to 56%. So, you know, I think the big thing is that yeah, when we're looking at ethnic and racial differences, you have to genuinely do a good job in terms of providing a granular analysis. I think using broad acronyms like uh, BAME, utterly useless, completely useless. I think indeed, even the term black at times masks over very, very real differences between people of black African and black Caribbean origin. I think there is very interesting that Kevin was also talking about that sense of discipline um, when he, which he encountered in East Africa, that, that, that cultural discipline which is promoted in the household, um, presenting yourself very well when you go to school. I think it's interesting there because again, you have those very clear differences um, between uh, pe uh, pupils of Black African origin and pupils of Black Caribbean origin. If you actually see level of educational attainment in schools, pupils of Black African origin are actually doing very well. On the other hand, unfortunately, pupils of Black Caribbean origin, they're, they're lagging behind. Let's be honest about that. Do I think that family structures come into play? Possibly. I think that there's a higher proportion of uh, two parent households within Black African communities in comparison uh, when compared with Black Caribbean communities. And I think that th these discussions, I know they're very sensitive. But the reality of the matter is they do have an impact. I think it's inevitable that they'll have, an, they'll have an impact. I think when we're looking at maybe if I take a group which I think has integrated exceptionally well done, um, it made considerable headway in terms of economic progress. I think people of Indian origin have done especially, I've done especially well in the UK, almost in the sense that while they've they adopted a positive attitude to integration, perhaps because a decent proportion actually originate from diverse areas in India. Many came from East Africa as well, where they were also the minority there. They're more used to living in more diverse contexts, mixing with people who may be a different racial, ethnic or religious background to them. And they carry those attitudes forward when they move to the UK, which is a multiracial, religiously diverse democracy. Also with British Indians, especially when I'm talking about um, those who were expelled from East Africa under the aggressive process of Africanization. They were the backbone of those economies. Great entrepreneurial spirit, considerable business acumen, and that, that was very useful for them when they, when they relocated into Britain's market economy. But the key thing with British Indians is that they still maintain that sense of, you know, strong family bonds are highly prioritised. That sense of, you know, edge, academic excellence, I think it's key there. And I wouldn't go as far as saying there can be so, no such thing as too much integration, even though that's something that David Goodhart alluded to in one of the earlier talks, um, uh, earlier talks for the Aquino project. But I almost feel that British Indians, in a sense, they've struck the sweet spot of integration, where they maintain the strong family bond, still relatively high um, levels of um, in-group marriage uh, when compared to other ethnic minority groups. So I think you have to have these, the, the, the reality of the matter is when you're looking at ethnic and racial disparities, A, you have to be honest that in terms of them actually existing, um, all too often we do, we're presented with acronyms, which I think mask over very real differences between different non-white um, ethnic groups in the UK. And B, you have to be honest that while there are, as I said, there are issues with the broader, for example, labor market system, to, to, uh, there's definitely headway, there's definitely room for improvement when it comes to creating a more meritocratic society where rewards and opportunities are ultimately allocated on the basis of merit. But ultimately, you know, as I've said before, if you don't talk about the internal cultural factors or you don't start talking about how we can resolve those issues, certain groups will continue 
to suffer from what I'd consider to be social and economic stagnation. Great, thank you. Um, very substantive answer. Thank you, Ricky. Um, Ishmael, you were shaking your head a lot during um, Rakib's contribution. Why, why is that? As someone who's been doing youth and community work for 15 years, um, yes, don't get me wrong, there's many affluence within the Indian community, but to say that they're totally integrated... I didn't say I that. Um, they've I totally actually made the point there's high levels of in-group marriage, and I said that there's actually... There's yeah, that's, that's, but, but that, that's what I heard. I, yeah. um, and there's a lot of issues of caste, the caste system, because the caste system that was within India has been brought over here within the Indian community because I, as someone who works in schools, works in youth clubs, works with temples um, in partnership with interfaith organizations, we get many complaints of people from different castes looking to marry and they can't marry and they're both Indian. So yes, there's excellence within the Indian community, hands up, I can't say that, but we need to, um, I think from what I heard from you with respect, I, I, I think that was like a, a paintbrush over many issues. And as you're right, there's issues around the word Bain, but as someone who used to work in banking, um, before I got into youth and community work, if it's not Bain, it's going to be another word, Jane or Game or Lane. Or none of them. They, yeah, ideally, yes, but the reality is we're living in a country where people of African, Afro-Caribbean, Asian, Arab, and dual heritage are a minority. So for statistics purposes, so my, my sister, for example, um, let me say it anyway, she works for the treasury. So part of her job is she has to um, get the statistics on how, what percentage of people are from so-called communities. So yes, I'm not a big fan of Bain, but the reality is if it's not Bain, it's gonna be another word. So I see that as a minor, but the main thing I wanted to say is we, um, many of us are delusional to the problems, yes, there's problems in the Afro-Caribbean community. I'll be the first to say that as someone of Jamaican heritage, okay? My wife is of Nigerian heritage and the African community are doing better than the Afro-Caribbean community. No doubt about that. But we have to look um, at, there are some issues within communities that the elders are putting their heads in the sand. Henceforth, it's having repercussions to the young people in communities. That's why I was not in my head. Um, so I guess to, I would I have a few questions for you, Ishmael, but I think even if there is a remnants of the caste system, I guess perhaps Rakib's point was that it's not necessarily prevent. Yeah, I mean, if I could just, if I could come back on those points, I think the idea that I would describe the Indian population as a homogenous uh, population is something that I'm not remotely interested in. Okay. I'm very much aware that it's a very religiously diverse population. Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, uh, there's even uh, people who followed the Roman Catholic faith. Uh, it's also internally stratified. I was talking about more broadly, if you look at ethnic minority, and I find it interesting that you'll go towards that kind of granular analysis, Ishmael, but then talk about how it's a minor that acronyms such as BAME are used. I'll be completely honest with you. I think we should strongly encourage public agencies and private institutions to scrap BAME from most of their analysis and actually make it and almost applies considerable pressure as a bare minimum for black British people. It should be as a bare minimum broken into black African and black Caribbean. I'd even want to see more granular um, analysis for the black African origin population, because the reality of the matter is there might be a big difference between well-established people of West African origin who follow the Christian faith in comparison to Muslim refugees, which have fled war-torn areas and war-torn countries such as Somalia. The whole point is, if you keep on going towards with BAME, JAME, LAME, anything else, I'm not interested in the slightest. And I speak as this, as someone who's done a PhD in the socio-political attitudes of British ethnic minorities, as someone who has a quantitative analytical background, that if you just go towards this sort of homogenizing tendencies or you carry on with them, you're going to miss very serious differences and you're, going to, you're not going to be able to identify problems which are more concentrated within particular groups and the reality of the matter is if you do not go to that extent when it comes to the analysis you're not going to be able to identify those problems nor are you going to be able to address them in an effective manner um i respectfully disagree if i can respond 
um, so quickly respond, but I have a few questions I want to ask, and I would like to bring in the other panelists as well. But okay, yeah. A quick response. Yes, my my main issue as someone who does youth and community work, we need to address issues straight on. Challenging things like BAME, I see as a waste of time because we have issues of in our community in communities, and we have to understand. Whether we like it or not, we are of different heritages, different backgrounds. That's the reality, whether we like it or not. Mm. We need to find ways on how we can build together. Before the Black Lives Matter issue happened with George Floyd, everyone has to admit, in communities around the UK, the Brexit issue was finished. In the first few months of COVID, I could say happily, I saw people of different communities working together. I saw Muslims working with white communities, white communities, working with black communities. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that for that first six months, I was so happy. Um, I might seem like a mean and grisly guy. I went to a particular place and I saw so much community cohesion for people from different faiths, backgrounds, heritages, working together to feed the poor and needy. I nearly got a little tear coming up my hand. Okay, so I believe that when we're, when we're doing things like this Bane thing, this is sidetracking the issue and this oh, is causing great. more division, more ignorance and more discontent mm. in communities in the UK. We're British, we're from the UK. Mm. We, wish, we should learn to respect each other's heritage and opinions and move on and strive towards greatness, strive towards community cohesion. Okay, so I have a few questions for you, Ishmael, if we can all keep oh. it short and sharp and then I'll bring in the other panel. I will. So um, you mentioned quite a a lot of different things. I mean, you talked about attitudes, you talked about critical thinking, but you also talked about unconscious bias. And I think that, what would you say? It, I mean, you, you work with, uh, you know, gang violence and knife crime. What would you say are the top three things that draw young people into violent crime? That it, would you really say that it is, you know, uh, kind of bias from the policing or are there specific top three things that you find are repeated reasons why certain groups that you interact with most in your work get drawn into criminal behavior? I would say the first thing is lack of a good role model within the circle, whether it's at home or within the community. I would say that's the first thing. The second thing is negative music. When we're hearing our music, glorifying killing, glorifying drug dealing, glorifying this, glorifying this, it starts to normalize everything. Then the third thing I would say would be the lack of community leadership. Because some young people are going through these issues in communities and because of this content within communities, young people don't know where to go. So I would say it's, it's, the, it's these three things. And then I would say on top of that, what racial inequality is a reality, but I do, that's the fourth thing. But I would say these three things are the most important things. Thank you. And so um, I'd like to go to you, Nick. Um, so you mentioned, um, uh, you know, a kind of culture of, we need like a culture of aspiration and um, you know, you, and all of those types of things. How do we cultivate that though? Because I think everyone in the panel seems to agree that we need to raise aspiration, that we care about education, but how, how do we really cultivate that as a society? In your opinion? As, yep, as Kevin said, Kevin alluded to it. If you read any government reports about the development of the child, by the time a child is three or four years old, you can almost map out that child's life. You know, They've not got the communication skills. You can see the, the way they're being brought up, their parents, the masturbation, the way they play with other children. And that's at three, four years old. One of the best conversations I ever had was with a primary school teacher. Um, and I was working in an area in Manchester and I went into the school to talk about this young boy who was, he was 10 and he was our most prolific offender on the estate. Um, and the primary school teacher was not surprised and said, I could have told you that the day he turned up at school at four. So we do know the families who are struggling. We do know the, the parents who are struggling. And at primary school, we know the children who are struggling. But because the low level issues at that point, 
we tend to forget about and ignore it until those young people are reaching the middle teens and then we're looking at enforcement and arresting them and we've wasted 10 years of inter interventions we could have been doing with that young person and with that family. I understand why interventions are very expensive and you can never claim 100% that your intervention made a difference. It just may have been coincidence, it may have been someone else's influence. So when you're trying to write these projects and prove to government and prove to funders, this is what I want to do. You can, it's not like black and white where I did that. It, it's really difficult. Um, so that's a really big issue. I think something else we've lost in our society over the last 50 years, 60, 70 years, is a sense of shame. We're, we're, there's no shame anymore now. I remember growing up as a kid where my mum would say, don't you ever bring the police to this door. Don't you ever. And I didn't, luckily enough. Um, that's gone. We look at the Jeremy Kyle shows that used to be on, which showed the worst of us, the most dysfunctional people in our country. And all that did was make other dysfunctional people who weren't as bad as them go, I must be okay because I'm not sleeping with my granddad, 17 year old fiance. So I must be normal. And we've lost a whole sense of shame. Shame was a creation in societies to make sure we followed society rules. And sometimes shame went too far and people were persecuted. I'm not suggesting that's what we go back to that, but some of the society rules that we should agree on as a society, we then should shame people to follow those rules, but we flipped it on its head. And now we're allowed to do whatever we want to do. And it's our life and we can do whatever we want to do. And until we tackle that, then it's very hard to change some of our cultures and some of our norms now in society. But when you talk about, you know, um, the kind of in, in, intervening when we see kids very early on in certain circumstances, who is going to be doing that intervening? Would that be the state? Because I think earlier on you criticised this kind of uh, state responsibility and almost this welfareism, which takes away the responsibility from the parents to actually raise their kids properly. Yeah, who, whose responsibility is it when it comes to um, you know those kids very early on? It's everybody's everybody's responsibility. So the state needs to take some part in it, even if they're just the funders. Mm. I mean, I'm, I do believe that local community groups are in a better position and will do a better job than the local town hall sending social workers around um, because those families won't want to engage with the town hall because they're seen as the authority figures you know they're going to take my kids away but they're more likely to engage with the local church if they go to church the local community centers and we need other groups setting up so some of it is the help and support but what we need to get away from is that taking away all responsibility from parents so parents now don't feed their children during school holidays. The state and school will do it. Um, I don't need to pay my council tax. The state will take out of my benefits. I don't need to do so. We're slowly chipping away at people's personal responsibility. And we wonder why at the end they're almost useless living in a society. And I heard a term several years ago um, and I've always used it ever since. And they called it learnt helplessness. We've taught people to be helpless in our society because somebody, mainly the state, will always step in. And do a bad job, by the way, but somebody will always step in. So we need to build personal responsibility. But that's not about leaving families on their own and saying, do it all yourself, you know, be a better parent. Well, if they could be a better parent, they would be better parents. It's about offering that support and taking them on a journey and not this, we're going to turn up for three weeks. We're going to show you how to boil an egg and then we're gone. Well, three weeks isn't going to do anything. If that mum was raised poorly by her mum, who was raised poorly by her mum, this becomes a cultural norm. The amount of parents who have said to me when I've had discussions around, especially about education, but around behaviour, about violence, and parents have said to me, well, that's what I got taught, so it's okay. So... It's about unpicking that and saying you may have been taught that and that may have been how you were brought up, but it may not have been the right way. But you need to do it in a tactful way. And the way you do that is local community groups. Thank you, Nick. So um, 
yes, I'd like to bring you in now, Kevin. And obviously, you didn't really talk about um, your mm. your work in policing, but I'm definitely really interested in that. I mean, in your experience and knowledge, um, what what did you find were the the common factors that drew young people in particular into um, criminal behaviour? Well, I'll, I'll come to that, but I'll, I'll, I'll come to this. If I was a patrolling constable right now, uh, of an evening, particularly towards the end of the weekend, there can be few more challenging areas to patrol than Merthyr Tidville in South Wales. And Merthyr Tidville in South Wales has virtually got no people of colour living in it. But it's got the highest levels of social deprivation and the highest levels of teenage single parent mums in the whole country. Why is that? Well, the pits, the coal mines, they closed over 50 years ago in that area. There's no work. The car factories, which were once there, have all but gone. There's very little work in the steelworks. There is nothing. There is nowhere for anyone to aspire to. So that means some of the council estates, and I don't want to tarnish Merthyr Tidville people because there's lots of great people there, but some of the council estates are war zones. The kids have got no chance whatsoever of even moving to Cardiff, let alone out of Merthyr Tidville, because there's nothing. So I'll go back to that and move it on to uh, Nick's point and some of the points the, the other panelists have presented. It all comes down to that early intervention with the families. And although Nick said it should Are you still there? Hello? Yes. It should be done by local communities, churches, and so on. The fact is, in many places, such community spirit does not exist. Mm -hmm. The only people who can really do that are government funding via the local authorities with, yes, social workers and educationalists who can try and engage with groups, um, I won't say Ismail's group, but similar minded groups within the community who can get in there and help with that parenting. But there's one reason why that is just not going to happen. And I know that from personal experience. Because in 2012, when I became the elected police and crime commissioner uh, for Surrey, my role essentially was to oversee all community safety activity in the county, which meant I worked with all the local authorities, police, anyone. One thing we were starting to do in Surrey was to develop a scheme to support families. We didn't call them troubled families, we didn't tarnish them or give them a, a kind of bad name, we called them supported families. But we all know what we're talking about, people who needed help at an early age. There's no money for that. When we've got a society now where old people are sitting in their feces and urine, or disabled people get one 10 minute visit a day because there's no money, for adult social care or even child care, it's not going to happen. So where I'm coming at is this. Politically, as a country, we really need to understand the point that Nick made and the other panelists made, that if you don't inculcate the correct culture at the early stages with children, then we're going to be getting these, these problems going on forever. And it's a question of us, <coughs> all of us, understanding the police ain't going to solve this. The prisons aren't. The probation aren't. Youth diversion work is not going to solve this. And neither are teachers. We need to understand how kids uh, develop and how they grow. That's, my, that's one point. The second point is, and this is a thing that has concerned me in my whole time whilst I was serving in the police, which was this issue of there are not enough round faces in the police, or whatever, one could, or whatever the correct term is these days visible ethnic minority representation, whatever the buzzword is, BAMES or whatever. I used to tear my hair out as a South East London boy from Lewisham, trying to deal with people and say, it isn't about getting more people of colour or brown faces in. You are not going to do it by going out and advertising and saying, come and help your communities and so on. That just doesn't work for a 19 year old, a 21 year old university graduate. There's got to be a better offer which appeals to their more visceral inner feelings about this is an interesting job, it's quite well paid, and it's not boring. 
and all this rubbish that you that you see being spread about let's get more colored people of, of that's the wrong term people of color coming in the police to make a difference to community it doesn't work young people don't join the police for that reason you know uh, I, you know i'll give you an example um I, I once went to a recruitment conference how are we as a police boss going to get more people of color to join the police and i'm in the as you all do of the evening we all went for a curry in the indian restaurant down in bristol or somewhere and i said you've got to get real granularity about all the ethnic groups in the country and work out why they're joining and why they're not because aspirational hindus are not going to get their kids to join the police because they want them to be doctors lawyers accountants professional engineers or pharmacists they're not going to join many people of central african heritage will not want their kids to join the police because they come from countries where the police are savagely brutal and utterly corrupt and the last thing you'd ever want having aspired to leave that is for your kids to join a body that you might perceive of has those same values that that's my point you might even say why don't more Nepali ex Gurkhas join the police or the kids join the police? Because the men all joined, they came from hill villages in Nepal, did 20 years in the British Army. Why don't they want their kids to join the police? You would think natural move from being a police officer. No, they want them to be doctors, pharmacists, dentists. And in fact, it is, it is uh, the reality that the first Nepali Gurkha Someone who served 23 years in the British Army is a very close friend of mine. I recruited him uh, from recruited him. Um, well, first of all, I supported him in being the first Gurkha ever to get British nationality because the treatment of Gurkhas is, frankly, or was the last true government institutionalized bastion of institutional racism that they were not allowed to stay having done 20 odd years in the British Army. But this guy, this guy, I helped him get his passport started, the campaign off and so on. But he was, he was at a stage, what can he do? Now, he joined the police because he could see it was quite well paid, quite interesting. But the last thing he wanted was his kids to become coppers. That's why one of them is now a consultant paediatric surgeon. Another one's a dentist. Another one's just qualified as a doctor. And another one's headmistress of a school. Different ethnic groups particularly immigrant ethnic groups have different aspirations for their kids and the thing that's very important people don't get this about immigrants who come to this country they come often on very difficult journeys they've taken a big risk they're semi-entrepreneurial they're aspirational and the last thing many of them want are their kids to join state organizations if they wanted that they'd have stayed back in nigeria or jamaica or india or uganda or wherever they want their kids to do better than being a state employee. So that's a, this, this is one of the big issues you've got about trying to recruit people of colour to the police, that culturally, it's not something they'd want to do. And I, in a way, alluded to what, what the nature of the problem is when I said nine of my family are in the police. We are now the third generation of my family who are in the police because police, a large number of people who joined the police actually follow their their parents their brothers their sisters or close friends into the police and i include in that black people who join the police because they may have had an uncle in the jamaica constabulary force or they may have been a sikh in the british colonial police in kenya and i'm using examples of people i refer to here so the point i'm going back to is here when we deal with these issues of uh, if you like bame or race or cultural disadvantage you really got to get into the granularity of each ethnic group, what their religious backgrounds are, how long they've been in the UK, where they've come from, because you can't broad brush it all. And I'll finish on one final point, because I've talked a lot. When I was police and crime commissioner in Surrey, we had an organization there called the Muslim Police Association, whose role it was, or they perceived of it, as our role is to uh, do more for Muslims in the police. So a bunch of them came in to see me, one of them, um, a lady with a, a full hijab on, who was a civilian employee. And I meekly challenged them and said, well, um, you're, the black, you're the Muslim Police Association. What are you here for? We're here to help uh, Muslims in the police. I said, well, actually, I fund you on behalf of the public. 
What are you doing to make Surrey as a county safer as Muslim members of the Muslim Police Association? Because after all, 8% of our population in North Surrey are of Pakistani Muslim heritage. And when you, when you tend to find sometimes when you get people within these groups, they don't really look at the big picture where they ought to be, how they add value. But the, this, isn't what I'm, this isn't what I'm talking about. The lady, I said to her, she was very well educated. I said to her, well, you're obviously very enthusiastic. You know, like working for Surrey Police and you work in one of the civilian departments. Why don't you become a sworn officer and you can wear a veil, a hijab, if you like, with one better one. Why don't you do that and inspire other Pakistani heritage ladies within the North Surrey area to join the police? And her answer was simple. We don't encourage our women to join such bodies as the police. So here we've got a very well educated Pakistani heritage, oh no, Muslim heritage, actually she was East, she was East African, a heritage woman, actually saying, we don't encourage our women to join the police. So there's major issues on all of this kind of stuff, which goes back to the point, certainly that Rakib was saying earlier, we need real granularity to understand all these different communities that we are within our, our country to move it forward. And I go back and start with, the white work under underclass people of former coal mining families heritage who are stuck in poverty with no hope whatsoever in places like Merthyr Tidville because social economic movement is not just uh, an issue for uh, people of, of colour of one form or another. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, very, very um, insightful, and I think a theme that's really drawn out of this conversation has been nuance. And I think you know, for the last twenty minutes, I'm gonna. Um, read out some questions that um, have been sent in and so pick up from any of them I'll read a few at a time and anyone from the panelists um, panel can actually answer um, um, so one of the questions is do we focus too much on race and ethnicity um, actually I mean you you kind of mentioned uh, white working class boys there isn't the problem more than ultimately of class and actually there is an over focus of you know this ethnic if ethnic group um, this race. Um, I, another question is, you know, what would be the top five things um, that the panelists uh, would change or, 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 or recommend um, going forward to deal with any of the, the issues that we've described? Um, and I think this is from what was touched upon earlier. Another question has been, you know, what role does the welfare state um, play in all of this? Um, Yes, and what role does institutional racism play, if at all, in, in poor socioeconomic outcomes? So there's a few more questions, but uh, I'll put these ones out there first for any of the panellists that want to jump in on any of them. Well, can I jump in on this issue about is it class? Um, my mum comes from a council house in Dagenham, and my, grand, my dad did. Uh, one, one grandfather ended up being a Ford car worker, and the other one was a factory hand working down in Thurrock in Essex. We weren't a rich family, and I can remember the days where my mum used to have to cut an apple into quarters so that my brothers could each get a quarter of an apple a week. And once a week, the pop lorry used to come round, and we used to search round for pop bottles so we could go out and get one bottle of cream soda for the treat for the family. But what my mum did for us, come in, and we didn't own our own house, she gave us firm values about education, dressing properly, being polite, having the correct manners. So I don't see this necessarily as a class issue. It's an issue about the cultural, correct cultural values being inculcated uh, into the kids. Because I'll go back to Kenya again. Some of those kids can't afford shoes. But my goodness me, do they behave well at school? Do they study well at school? And if uh, they, they get the opportunity, they will move forward to the highest levels of education. So it's not a class or poverty issue. It's a cultural valued one that, that, that we need to get in at the earliest stages, talking about Nick's point, about aspirations uh, and, and so on. Um, and, you know, again, Rakib said exactly the same. You know, we have got to get this granularity 
when we look at any issue and not just broad brush, this is a class issue. Anyone else want to pick up on the, the questions that have been made? There was questions on, you know, on welfareism, top five things that you would change. Is there an over-focus on race and ethnicity when we should be thinking of Britishness more broadly? Anyone else want to pick up? Can I? Oh, Dr. Rakib, did you? Um, I, I think I just wanted to uh, follow up on uh, Kevin's point that he made. Say if you have a working class family, um, you know, the main earner is a, a blue collar worker. But if they're promoting values such as hot, the dedicated work ethic, discipline, routine, you know, the, the children in the household, you know, the, these are the values that are being, you know, that's being instilled into them. But by, and more generally, it's a stable family unit. You compare that against a middle class family, perhaps, you know, perhaps not as stable. Perhaps those values are not promoted as enthusiastically. Which family's richer? Because in my view, in a sense, if, if you see that if world class does play a part, I think it's, it's important that the values being promoted within the household are key when, and especially if it's a fairly early stage, as, you know, as, as Kevin's uh, discussed, it's key in terms of the child's development, in terms of their approach to, you know, how they approach education, um, right values such as, you know, treating people fairly, irrespective of their racial, ethnic or religious background. That's not a class thing. That's something that will be taught within a lot of working class households of different racial and ethnic backgrounds across the UK. So I think va values count for a lot. Um, I think just going back, because we've talked about um, white working class disadvantage. I think we're looking at social mobility. I think there's been a culture of snobbery for too long towards vocational education. Um, I think, unfortunately, under New Labour, um, there was this promotion of academic education. Let's just get, you know, a certain threshold of young people into universities. I think what we need now to, to work against, you know, sustained industrial decline in post-industrial areas, such as Merthyr Tydfil in Wales, such as the so-called Red Wall, places like Bowles over in provincial Derbyshire, when you're talking about places like Bassett Law in provincial Nottinghamshire. I'd like to see really high quality skills colleges being put in a lot of those communities. I want them to be highly drilled, strong sense of discipline in those institutions and say, don't think that your skill is second rate. It's not second rate. If someone asked me to fix a boiler, I'd flood their whole gaff within seconds, okay? Everyone has a purpose and ultimately, that, that, that would be grassroots. It'd be great to have politicians at different levels talking about it. But that kind of change will take a while because the reality of marriage, when you're talking about that culture of snobbery towards vocational education, um, I think in terms of families, the reality of the matter is there is there are cases of family unit um, dysfunction across a range of communities. That's where you do need a bit of a social safety net. You need um, reliable social services. Uh, but then also community spirit comes into play. I think that all you know we've had we've had a culture where perhaps there's too much emphasis on individualism and materialism to an extent as well i think that sense of you know communitarianism i think if that made a bit of a comeback i think that would make um that'd be a great social benefit to the uk across a range of different communities so i think just to, just to summarize my point i think in terms of socioeconomic outcomes I think we need to have more of a welfare state which enables as opposed to an activist state. I think there's a lot of communities that they're trapped in a cycle of intergenerational dependency. And I think that's a big problem. But that's not to say that you should dismantle the welfare state. I think it's a matter of how you're using public expenditure in the UK. If you pump much of that money into infrastructure, developing those, you know, those sophisticated vocational systems, that, that's the use of public expenditure, but I think ultimately it could it could deliver high, you know, long, longer term returns for the country, especially for communities which have been neglected for far too long. Thank you, um, Ricky. Um, Nick, did you want to yeah. pick up? Yeah. yeah, I think for me, there's two there's two warnings when we're engaging young people on the streets in across Greater Manchester. Um, the first one is no five at home rings a big bell. And the second one is failing at education. Um, and we've got almost two decades experience now. Of if, if, if a young person, if that's their life, no father at home, and they've been kicked out of school or failing in school, we know they're on the wrong path. All, almost definite all the time. Um, talking about 
what we're going to do, especially around schooling, is we just mentioned technical colleges. I'd like to see that brought earlier. I'd like to see technical secondary schools where parents and kids have a choice. So you finish primary school, you've now got a choice of your secondary school, you go visit them like you do, but you always visit them in the evening when there's no kids there, so you can't even see what the school's like really. But a different type of school in neighbourhoods where you still do your English and maths, but then you can be, you, you can then get encouraged to do other things such as coding, such as, you know, hands-on stuff like bricklaying and accountancy, self-employment, and we keep those young people engaged. So at least when they come out of that school, well, first of all, we don't then end up sending them to a pre a pre referral unit, which are basically mini jails. We keep them in the school setting and they're not going to be dumping grounds for non-academic children. These children and parents have a choice. So at 11, they go, I want to go to that school. Do you know why? Because Billy down the street went to there three years ago and he's got an apprenticeship and he's a plumber now and he's earning 39 grand a year. I'll have a bit of that because I don't want to go to university. Or Jane down the road is, is a programmer now. She's just helped develop this game that they're selling on Amazon. Or we might have someone who's not academically gifted, who leaves school at 16, who's now been trained to be a housekeeper in a, in a, in a hotel. Chambermaid, making beds. It's not the greatest job in the world, but she may not be academically gifted, in which case she leaves school with a skill for our service industries and waiting until the 16, 17 for the college type. If we're waiting that long, we've, we've, we've lost a whole stream of kids who just turn up at school at 11 years old. It's not for them. They tune out and that's the end of it. They either turn up every day and learn nothing or they end up playing, playing up, getting kicked out. If you can imagine going to school, you've loved, you like primary school, everyone knows your name. You turn up at 11 at this huge school with hundreds of kids, no one knows who you are. And all of a sudden you feel stupid, you feel on your own. You're sat in classes, you're not getting it. People are laughing at you. And every day you're sent back again and again and again to be made to feel as if you're stupid. And you wonder why they leave at 16, angry and disenfranchised. We turn him into that. Thank you, Nick. Um, Ishmael? Yeah, um, basically, as someone, because I'm running a, a mentor project in Mossside, and I'm also doing a school project in Harlesden in London. And I believe that we need to um, promote cultural values, because um, there are shared values. When people are talking about people of different heritages, different backgrounds, there are many shared values within British values as well. So we should be sharing shared values and also promoting discipline, respect and manners, um, aspirations, boundaries, and community spirit and community responsibility. And I, I'm a strong advocate for there being uh, a middle way um, network of organizations who build bridges between communities and statutory organizations. So for example, um, I believe personally the Muslim Association of Police, the Black Association of Police, I believe they're a waste of money. I believe the money that's given to them, okay, because yeah, my interaction with people from Muslim Association of Police and the Black Association of Police They've been utterly useless. And I know they've been given money by the police. What they should be doing, they should be utilized in communities to promote good relationships between, so for example, the Black Association of Police should be utilized into bringing good relationships between the Black youth, Black youths in communities, and the police. Same like the Muslim Association of Police. They should be utilized within the Muslim community to build bridges between the Muslim community and the police. So we, there are a lot of these associations around that are getting money and all they're doing is just wasting taxpayers' money. They need to be utilized and they need to get off their backsides and start doing some work in communities. And also, I believe that we need to be promoting aspirations to our young people. Finally, there's something called NCS. National Citizenship Service is only open to young people who are aged 16 to 17. 
which is sometimes a bit frustrating because sometimes you might meet someone who's 14 who, who you should be going on, but you can't get them on. So I strongly believe that young people in care, young ex-offenders, young ch children who are permanently excluded from school, young kids with special educational needs, i.e. autism, ADHD, they should be on this NCS program compulsory for free. Because the NCS program, they get millions from the government and so much is wasted on red tape and silliness. So NCS can be a good way of engaging with young people um, from marginalized, disenfranchised and underprivileged backgrounds. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question for Ishmael and Kevin. I mean, a lot of, again, what has been spoken about is, is um, you know, promoting values, responsibility, role models. And I, I want to ask this very bluntly because we hear a lot in the media about, um, you know, so-called black on black crime or black boys being drawn into life crime. Is this a construct or is this real? If it's real, why is it that black boys, it is said, are disproportionately involved in violent crime. Why is that? If it's not real, why um, do you think this idea is uh, so prevalent? So I'd like to ask both of you two um, from your experience in this area. Black, okay, does Nick want to go first? I don't know. All right, black on black crime is real and it's an epidemic, especially in London, Birmingham and Manchester. But Asian on Asian crime is real in Bradford, in Leicester and Birmingham as well. And white and white crime is big in parts of Manchester, in parts of Glasgow, and in parts in, in the UK. Now, the reason for the black and black crime, in my opinion, are because of four main things. One, a lack of community leadership. So there's no one there's not a, a, a black British organization who identify as being black and British, okay? Who are working to serve black British people who, are, who can mediate in communities. This is what's needed. And it doesn't need to be government funded. It could be self-funded. That's the first thing. The second thing is the community or black community organizations who say they're challenging knife crime, who say they're challenging crime, the sad reality is they're not, majority of them are not working together in a network. Everyone seems to be like a cowboy. So because there's no unison in challenging knife crime, that's, that's what part of the problem. The third issue is many of the experienced um, anti-knife crime practitioners within communities, many of them are, how can I say, they're exhausted, they're tired, lack of funding, lack of, um, this is not even for community organizations, these are people working in the youth service. Many people who work for youth services within local authorities have been made redundant, their, uh, their contracts have been reduced, so they feel exhausted. The reality is, yes, you can save the youth, but if your partner is saying, look, we've got bills to pay, I need shopping, I want to take the kids there, a lot of them are exhausted. So many of the experienced youth workers, like the same thing with many of the experienced bobbies that used to be on the street, like, like they say, ah, oh, give you a trip around the air roll if you get out of hand. A lot of those experienced bobbies were made redundant as well. The fourth thing, is, the fifth thing is, the people who are advising the government, the people who are advising the mayor of Manchester and the mayor of London on knife crime, on counter knife crime, are out of touch out of date and they don't have a clue okay and they have no track record in youth and community engagement so because people seem that those people don't care so people in communities are thinking if they don't care why should we care thank you ishmael and you kevin what's your um, perspective well my perspective is i agree virtually with everything that ishmael is saying um there is no question uh, that there is a real issue with um, black on black crime, particularly young black males. Uh, they actually represent 15% of the total of people who get murdered in the UK every year. Uh, when you think that's one eighth of all the people who get murdered in the UK are young black males, um, that kind of figure, I think it's 14%, 14.4. 
that kind of shows you when one considers that that demographic between the ages of about 13, 14 and 25 is probably less than half a percent of the population. That shows you how stark the problem, problem is. And indeed, you know, if you look at the latest publications from King's College Hospital um, in South East London of people being brought in who have been shot, they are almost 100% young uh, black males uh, who make up um, probably three or four percent of the population of that catchment area for that hospital. So there is um, a significant uh, issue. And I recall when I was in the police that 85% of the most violent gangs uh, within London were um, of uh, black heritage. Uh, that's not to say that the most most violent ones were in fact travellers, uh, but that's, a, that's an aside, who <coughs> of course are white. Um, but yes, there is an issue there, uh, and of course that's one of the reasons why we end up with these difficult relationships, and again Ismail mentioned it earlier about inexperienced police officers, but these difficult relationships with young black people uh, and police, because part of the role of the police is to deal with the offences and stop it in whatever way they can, um, and if you, if you think about the journey of someone who joins the police in London, who may have been recruited, quite frankly, from the Isle of Skye, when he ends up walking the street in Brixton, you might as well put him on the planet Zog, because that's about how much he understands of the culture of where he is. Uh, so naturally, uh, naturally, he's going to end up judging by his first interactions and some of the values of old. I might add, there's no question um, that, that policing in the 50s and 60s brought back the colonial approach where lots of cops were soldiers who'd served in the Second World War uh, or had come back from working in colonial police forces. And they would, of course, have bigoted and racist views about people of color. <coughs> and that kind of takes a long while for that to, if you like, leave some of the value system uh, within the police. But one of the big problems, are, and, and from a policing point of view, and again, it all comes back to what I said to you before about the cuts to the ability of social services and education to intervene with families and, and single parents who need supporting. The cuts had another effect on, on the police, and it's still continuing. The middle, the, the first thing, it's, first thing they've, they've done in terms of changes to pay and conditions the police are now hemorrhaging out experienced police officers. The days of a constable walking the street down the Stockwell Road or Brixton Market who's been in the police 28 years and in his late 40s, early 50s are long gone because the paying conditions do not retain people uh, to stay and do that, that kind of work. Um, so, what we've got now, and combine it with the fact with the further cuts, that virtually all the police stations in the country have been sold, so there's no local police officers who know people locally, know the local kids, have got relationships in the schools, etc. So policing is where we are now. It's kind of a rush around fire brigade system made up by, in my view, pretty well-meaning, enthusiastic people, but really almost out of their depth. Thank you, Kevin. So, uh, just so what we're going to do, really sorry, Nick. So, we're just going to have one minute summary um, just to close because we're already going over time, unfortunately. So, um, uh, yeah, sorry that we haven't been able to answer everyone's questions. Very interesting, uh, multifaceted discussion. So, a one minute um, summary from each panelist, please, in terms of, you know, uh, just a solution um, to these, all of these huge problems that we've been discussing. So um, we'll start with you, Nick, as a, just one minute quickly, um, summary of your um, perspective. Yeah, for me, the one word summary is fathers. We need to get fathers back into the homes to help raise their children. They're their children, and they need to have a bigger influence on raising their children. And some of, the, and some of these issues hopefully would go away if we had fathers in the home. And that's my simple message. Thank you, Nick. Um, do Dr. Ricky? Yeah, I think, I think one thing I would say is it, for us not to be too negative. I think that for all the troubles that we've discussed over the course of this conversation, 
I'm still firmly of the view that Britain is one of the most successful post-World War II multiracial, religiously diverse democracies on earth. Now, I think the, the message I'd have is just a matter of not becoming too complacent. If we recognise that there are injustices, if there are particular issues surrounding social mobility, we need to be serious about addressing them. I make a big point about the welfare state. I think a lot of people talk about, oh, does it need to be trimmed down? You know, I think it's more about how it's shaped and how are spending prioritised, how is, how, what kind of shape do spending priority, uh, priorities take? So I think the one thing I'd say, invest in communities which have been neglected for too long, whether they're starved of meaningful public investment or create the economic conditions where they, they could be useful private sector investment in those kind of areas. I think in terms of creating a more meritocratic society, I think whether it's addressing those um, ethnic minority penalties in the labour market, but equally I'm, I'm, I'm totally against this idea of positive discrimination and the, the idea of this sort of uh, BAME quotas and all the rest of it. I actually think that could create a great deal of social resentment and it will actually undermine the authority of very talented, high achieving non-white individuals but people might think, oh, you're only there because of the quotas. You're only there because of you know, the, the fact that you're just there to fill in the numbers. So I think you need to strike the right balance when, it's on, when it comes to trying to create a more meritocratic society. So I think the message is, if you want to have a, a sort of unifying strategy, don't talk down Britain too much. Be, be honest, though, about the weaknesses which do exist. And the, the finest act of patriotism is not pretending that everything is great in your country. The best, the best way is to actually find productive ways, building coalitions to try and create a more resilient and cohesive country. Thank you. Excellent words, Ricky. Um, Ishmael? Yes, basically, um, we need to recognise that Britain is the most racially tolerant country in the world. And I'm saying that honestly from the heart as a man who's travelled around many countries. There are many rights and privileges that black people have here in the UK that we haven't got in many countries, including America. For example, a Rasta man in Jamaica, one of my parents, he has more rights here in the UK than in Jamaica. And also we need to get rid of negative, backward thinking, um, how can I say, victimhood activism that is breeding negativity to our young people telling our young people, yes, this is a racist society, you can't dream, you can't achieve, you can't have aspirations. This was another thing I should have added to the reason why a lot of young black youths are turning to crime. Because you have certain people who call themselves community leaders and youth workers telling our young people, Britain's a racist society, you cannot dream, you cannot achieve, and you should have no aspirations. And this is having a ripple effect to our young people. So we need to get rid of these, I call them, self-hate preachers out of the society and we need to promote community cohesion in communities. Thank you, excellent words as well Ishmael and last but certainly not least and we'd love to hear your summary um, Kevin before we close. Well how, how can I follow Rakeem, Ishmael and Nick's um, <laughs> closing comments because they are absolutely right um, you know, we are the most inclusive, fairest country in the world, and I've travelled all over the place and seen it my, myself, and I'm, I'm proud of, of that about this country. And we need to be talking it up, and Ishmael's absolutely right. We need to stop this culture of victimhood because it's extremely destructive and will not help those who perhaps need the greatest support. I, I, go, back to, I go back to my, my uh, original point. We're not going to fix this by having sticking plasters of some little knife crime initiative there, some little initiative there. We need to understand that good parenting, helping single parent teenage mums at the earliest stages is where we've got to start with this. And then looking at the way the economy is changing and picking up some of the other points, I think it was uh, from Nick about perhaps bringing more technical type uh, training skills uh, that, that can um, add value. But again, the big point that Ricky uh, said at the very beginning um, was uh, about, you know, we need to be emotionally intelligent when we look at all these different groups uh, and move towards being cohesive and stop all this divisive, uh, politically driven activism 
that we're seeing at the moment that's making it worse. Thank you so much, um, Kevin, and thank you so much to this fantastic panel. Um, you know, we need to keep having these conversations because the more we do, the more, you know, we have these answers and it's been really, really great. Thank you so much for your wonderful contributions.